All right, so in chapter 28, we'll talk about the reproductive system. And in this chapter, we'll just do an overview of the reproductive system. We'll start with the anatomy and physiology of the female reproductive system and then move on to male uh, reproductive anatomy and physiology. Now, just a general overview of the reproductive system. Both systems use uh, sex organs called gonads. And gonads are uh, the ovaries in females and testes in males. But the gonads are the sex cell creating organs. So in ovaries, they make oocytes. In the testes, those make sperm cells. This is the site of gamete formation. So a gamete is a sex cell. It's another word to, you know, another way to refer to sex cells is gametes. So the gonads are the, are the sex organs which make gametes or sex cells. And both systems utilize a, uh, a series of ducts which are used to transport gametes and store them or act as a site of fertilization, like for females. Um, so what we find then in both systems are the gonads and their associated duct systems because you need something to transport those gametes uh, to particular areas, whether it's you know towards the uterus in females or out of the body in female or males. So what we find here then, we're going to start with the female system, and what we see here is a mid-sagittal view of the pelvic area, and this is almost identical to that model we just saw earlier in lab. But we can see things like our mons pubis, which is this fatty pad here of adipose just anterior to the pubic symphysis. Um, we find our pubic symphysis here just between the two halves of your pelvis, so it's a little bit of fibrocartilage. And then just posterior to the pubic symphysis, these are some pelvic organs. Remember, in the pelvic cavity, we find our urinary bladder, our uterus, as well as the rectum back here. So associated with our urinary bladder, we find the urethra, which extends down towards the external urethral orifice. Associated with our uterus, we find the vaginal canal, which opens up in a vaginal orifice. And it's also associated with the fallopian tube and ovary, which are suspended in position by something called suspensory ligaments. So the suspensory ligaments include things like your broad ligament, which is all of this, as well as the ovarian ligament that holds the ovary to the uterus. But these suspensory ligaments effectively hold the uterus, fallopian tube, and ovary in position. Because without those, they would actually kind of uh, sag due to the forces of gravity. So that's actually what holds those in position. Now just posterior to the, the uterus and vagina, we have our rectum, which then leads into the anus. And then we have our anal sphincter here, so we have our external and internal anal sphincters, uh, which we talked about back in the digestive system. Now, uh, some other re uh, external reprodu reproductive structures, we can see things like our labia majora. Um, and labia majora is made of like a thin skin that includes hair. Uh, just medial to that, we find labia minora. This is a thick skin, which is a, a keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Now, deep in the labia minora, we also find erectile tissue something called the bulb of the vestibule, which we'll talk about. And so uh, labia majora will actually engorge with blood during sexual excitement. And where the labia minora, I mean, uh, meets here at the clitoral, clitoral hood, you find the clitoris here. And the clitoris is actually made of also erectile tissue. So it's a little bit of corpus cavernosum that is uh, going to engorge with blood during sexual excitement. And there's a lot of nerve endings here, so it's a very sensitive area. Now, um, in terms of just the general anatomy of the female reproductive system, we'll talk about, you know, our primary sex organs are the ovaries. And there's two, you know, right and left. And then there's accessory sex organs that are associated with those ovaries. Remember the system of ducts that are used to transport gametes. So after ovulation, which is when the, when the oocyte or egg gets expelled from the ovary, that oocyte is actually picked up by these accessory systems, like our uterine tubes that transports the egg towards the uterus. And then the uterus is associated with other structures like the vagina, and, um, you know, externally we have our clitoris. And then also associated with the reproductive system, we have our mammary glands, which produce breast milk. Now, looking deeper in, in the pelvic cavity, we, this is another view of the, of the uterus in position. So this is an anterior view of the uterus. And so you can see that it's held in position by a lot of uh, suspensory <coughs> ligaments here. This, all of this large one here is called the broad ligament. So all of this is the broad ligament. And then these whitish structures over here are the ovaries. So what holds our ovaries in position then is the ovarian ligament right here. So the ovarian ligament holds the ovary to the uterus itself, ovarian ligament, which is on the medial part of the ovary. And then what's interesting about the ovaries though is that they're suspended within the suspensory ligaments and they're somewhat associated with these accessory organs, right? So what we find then is that the ovaries are suspended in the pelvic cavity and then what's associated with them, we have, we have our accessory organs like our fallopian tube or uterine tube also called the uh, oviduct. So 
the fallopian tube has a couple key areas here. We have our fimbrae, which is finger-like projections here that are associated with our ovary. The function of these fimbrae is to basically move and they create currents that help waft the ovulated egg up into the fallopian tube. Now, the, uh, this part of the fallopian tube here um, is called the infundibulum. And the infundibulum is a sharp curvature here. That leads into the rest of the fallopian tube, which then leads into what we call the isthmus, which is basically what connects the fallopian tube to the uterus itself. Now, the, because this is a tube, what we find is there's actually a hollow center here in the center of this fallopian tube. And the epithelium that lines this is actually a, a ciliated epithelium, so it actually helps transport that egg towards the uterus because the ciliac will help move that egg across the apical surface of those cells. Now, looking at the structure of the ovary, we, uh, internally, what we find then is that we have several key areas. We have our cortex, which is the outer layer here. We have our medulla, which is in the middle. The medulla has got a lot of blood vessels and lymphatics and nerve endings. And then associated with the cortex are our follicles. So over here, we find primordial follicles, which then mature into larger and larger follicles, which then can get ovulated. So the largest of which we can see here, this one's called the tertiary follicle or antral follicle, this is the one that precedes ovulation. And so uh, ovulation is going to be where this follicle actually fuses with the outer layer of the ovary. And the oocyte you find deep in the follicle actually gets ejected out of the ovary into the pelvic cavity and it's picked up by the fallopian tube after ovulation. Now lining the very outside of the ovary we find our tunica albuginea. And that has, as it's also associated with the germinal epithelium, which is just going to help support the structure of the ovary itself. And this is also held in position by our ovarian ligament. Now, uh, what this picture shows is actually a dissection from a cadaver. So what, what this picture shows is actually a cutaway view of the pelvic and abdominal areas. So you can see our, our pubic area. Remember the, the, little, the adipose here just anterior to the pubis is called mons pubis, which means pubic mountain. Just a little bit of adipose tissue just anterior to the pelvic area. And the purpose of this is just for cushioning. It's because it helps protect the pubic bones. So it, it provides some extra cushion between skin and bone. That way there's not a lot of damage there uh, when skin's rubbing up against you know, the potential for that bone there. So there's a little bit of cushioning there between the, between the skin of the pubic area and the bones there. So you have mons pubis. Uh, just posterior to this, we find the pelvic cavity. So here's all of our pelvic organs. So first we find our urinary bladder, and then just posterior to the urinary bladder, we find our uterus, and then posterior to that, we have our rectum, which is right here. And you can see that associated with the uterus, we have our fallopian tubes, or oviducts, or, or uterine tubes, and these things actually wrap around towards the ovary. So you can see these little whitish structures here, actually the ovaries. And the ovaries make, they make gametes, right, so the sex cells. And so what's interesting about these ovaries is, yes, they're suspended in these suspensory ligaments and held in position, but ovulation occurs... Uh, when the tertiary follicle fuses with the surface of this ovary and the egg actually gets expelled out into this cavity here. Now, it's, what's actually phenomenal and amazing about this whole process is that the fimbrae actually help pick up that egg from the pelvic cavity and help transport that egg then through the fallopian tube towards the uterus there. Um, if those fimbrae fail to pick up the ovulated egg, the, that egg can actually start to enter the pelvic area here where uh, it can either be digested and reabsorbed by immune cells in the body, or um, it could even be fertilized somewhere in the pelvic cavity where you can get something called an ectopic pregnancy, where a fertilized egg can actually implant somewhere in the pelvic tissue here, and it'll start to grow into a fetus, but it won't grow to full term, right? Like the pelvic cavity is not a good place for, for, to support fetal growth. Um, however, it will grow a little bit, so you can get a mass, you know, kind of a tumor-shaped mass there, but it won't actually, you know, grow to full term, if that makes sense. Um, so uh, we're going we're gonna to go into more detail on the structure of these ovaries here. And so, so each ovary is surrounded by an epithelial layer called germinal epithelium. And then deep to that, we have tunica albuginea, which is kind of a tougher fibrous tissue. And then deep to tunica albuginea, we have our cortex and our medulla. Remember, the cortex is the outer layer of the ovary here, but it's surrounded by tunica albuginea. And then deep to the cortex, we've got our medulla. Uh, you know, it's, it's significant to mention the cortex because it's within the cortex you find all of your follicles. So you have your primordial follicles, which then give rise to primary, secondary, and tertiary follicles. And these follicles contain your oocytes, which then become, you know, those are ovulated after um, puberty. Now, in the medulla, this is actually going to be a, a deeper area in the ovary that's full of blood vessels, nerve fibers, and lymphatics. So you find a lot of blood vessels there to support the structure of this ovary, you know, like, um, you know, Supply it with nutrients because it is an organ. You find lymphatics there to help drain any excess fluid away from the ovary. 
and those nerve endings there for you know sensations of like pain and that kind of stuff. Now uh, the cortex contains your follicles, and the medulla contains other connective tissues, blood vessels, lymph vessels, and nerves. So looking at the structure of the ovary in the cutaway view here, we can see this outer layer of cortex, a deeper layer of the medulla. So remember that we have a germinal epithelium on the outside of the ovary here. Deep to that we have our tunica albuginea, which is kind of a whitish tissue. Then we have our cortex, which has our follicles. We see our primordial follicles, which are the smallest ones here. And then deep to the cortex, we got our medulla, which has lots of blood vessels, nerve fibers, and lymphatics. Now the primordial follicles, which are small here, these actually start to develop during fetal development. So uh, while the ovaries were developing as a fetus, right, these primordial follicles started to develop even during fetal development. So here's the weird thing, is that if we are all the product of our mother's egg, right, our mother's oocytes in part, well, those oocytes started to develop in our mother while our mother was a fetus within our grandmothers. So what's odd is that some of the cells that would later become us started to develop while our mothers were developing within our grandmother, which is really weird to think about. Um, so they, and they call these primordial follicles. So they actually start to develop during fetal development. So that you see multi-generational effects then. So you hear about you know, how maybe your grandmother lived can actually affect you as a grandchild because the cells that would later become you were at some point within your grandma, which is actually kind of interesting. Now, um, these primordial follicles are small. You've got about 100,000 of these per ovary. Now, after puberty, these primordial follicles are going to start to develop. And they don't develop all at once. They start to develop, you know, several at a time or so. And typically per ovary, it's maybe about one at a time. Now, uh, these primordial follicles develop in response to hormones, which we'll talk about later. And as they develop, they grow larger. So pri primordial follicles develop into primary follicles which develop into secondary fo follicles, which then grow and develop into tertiary or mature follicles. And these are the ones that are going to be ovulated. So you can see how large they are, and they have a fluid-filled center. Now, once this fuses with the, court, uh, the outer layer of the over here, then the oocytes here in the center of the follicle gets ovulated out into the pelvic cavity, and these cells that line the follicle stay in the ovary. Now, for those cells that stay in the fo uh, those follicular cells that stay in the ovary, these follicular cells actually develop into something called corpus luteum, which is this large kind of popcorn kernel shaped structure here. Like it looks to me like the side of a popcorn kernel. Uh, <laughs> and uh, this is a lar, uh, it secretes a lot of hormones. So corpus luteum comes from the follicular cells after ovulation. And this, this corpus luteum secretes a tremendous amount of progesterone and estrogen. And the purpose of this is that the progesterone and estrogen that come from the corpus luteum actually support uterine growth. So the growth of the endometrium, which lines the inside of the uterus uh, after ovulation, which makes sense because if this ovulated egg gets fertilized, then the, the growing endometrium could potentially support that fertilized egg. Now, if fertilization doesn't occur, though, this corpus luteum will degrade into corpus albicans, which is basically means white body. Corpus means body. Albicans means white. So this degrades into corpus albicans, which is just basically a little bit of scar tissue, which used to be corpus luteum. And these corpus albicans will, will uh, start to accumulate over the course of so many different ovarian cycles. Now, uh, those ovarian follicles develop after puberty. Remember, uh, they start out as the uh, primordial follicle, which are tiny. Uh, now, these uh, follicles consist of two things. We've got oocytes and follicular, follicular cells. The follicular cells are what surround the outside of the whole follicle, the ovarian follicle. So the follicular cells form the outer boundary of that follicle. Deep within that ovarian follicle, we'll find our oocytes, we have primary and secondary oocytes. Primary oocytes begin to develop during fetal development, but then their development isn't arrested until puberty begins. Now, once puberty begins, primary uh, oocytes can start to develop into secondary oocytes, and these, these are the ones that are ovulated. Now, there's different types of ovarian follicles, and these all represent different stages of development. So you're looking at different um, stages here. So we, we, all, we start out as these primordial follicles here, which develop into primary, secondary, and then vesicular, antral, mature, or tertiary follicle. Those are all words for the same thing. Personally, I like tertiary because it kind of keeps with the whole flow here. If you go primary, secondary, tertiary follicle, that tells you it's the third, the third phase of development here. And um, that, that, it's easy to remember that way. However, um, it's also important to note that if you call it a vesicular follicle, it makes sense because it looks like a vesicle, right? The tertiary follicles, because they're large and fluid-filled, 
they have a vesicle-like appearance to them. So it also makes sense to call it a vesicular follicle. But tertiary follicle or mature follicle is another word to call it too, and that's appropriate. Now, uh, after ovulation, then, for the cells, the follicular cells that are left behind, those can turn into corpus luteum. And then what does corpus luteum secrete? Progesterone. progesterone and estrogen. So uh, the reason why I keep it that order is it's mostly progesterone and some estrogen. But you get a tremendous amount of progesterone being secreted by the cells of corpus luteum, which means yellow body. But then if, if fertilization doesn't occur with that particular ovarian cycle, then corpus luteum then degrades into something called corpus albicans. And corpus albicans is effectively like some scar tissue that's left behind from uh, you know corpus luteum. And uh, it's, it doesn't secrete any hormones. So what happens then is that you see that hormone levels drop off really sharply uh, while the corpus luteum starts degrading into corpus albicans. And it, we'll talk about how that is the stimulus for menses. Like the menstrual phase is actually stimulated to occur when there's a sharp drop in hormones when corpus luteum dies and turns into corpus albicans. Because then you stop secreting a tremendous amount of progesterone and estrogen, when those hormone levels fall sharply, that is the stimulus, stimulus for menstruation, which we'll get to here in a little bit. Now, we start out with these primordial follicles. And when do, the, when do these start to develop, you guys? Yeah, dur during fetal development, right? So that's kind of interesting. Now, these primordial follicles have our, we have our follicular cells that line the outside here. And, you know, they're, they're very, very thin cells at this point. They're kind of more of a simple squamous type of epithelium. And then deep to that, we have our primary oocyte. And the primary oocytes are the cells that will later divide into the mature gametes, okay? But these are the oocytes that can become a gamete. They're not a gamete yet because it's not a mature sex cell, but they will become gametes later. Now, um, what happens then, you guys, is at puberty, that's when primordial follicles are allowed to start developing into primary follicles. Now, that stimulus is actually due to hormonal changes that can occur at puberty. And when primordial follicles turn into a primary follicle, effectively what happens is the follicular cells get thicker here. So instead of being like a simple squamous type of epithelium, you see it's more of a stratified cuboidal type of epithelium. And uh, what we find that is still our primary oocyte locked in the middle here. Okay, so it's sort of encased in this whole uh, fluid-filled center. Now, what's interesting to you guys about these, these follicular cells is that during the development of this primary follicle, these follicular cells start releasing a little bit of estrogen. So these cells that are growing also release estrogen. Now, estrogen plays a role here in coordinating the events of development. But what's interesting is that for the little bit of estrogen that's being released by this primary follicle here, it actually inhibits further release of hormones that would otherwise stimulate more follicle growth. So what's interesting is that once follicles start to develop, they prevent other follicles from developing. Why does that make sense? Yeah, so you don't get tons of, of ovulated <laughs> eggs, right? If humans were allowed to have 30 follicles develop at once, and you have maybe 30 ovulations at one time, then we would produce litters, right? But we don't do that. Like, we, you know, we, <laughs> you're about like twins, triplets, you know, and then very rarely more than that, right? Um, but for the most part, we just have several ovulations at any moment, not many. And the way this is prevented is that these primary follicles here release a little bit of estrogen, which actually inhibits further follicular development. But here's the interesting thing, you guys, is that it inhibits the development of primordial follicles. And we'll get to this here in a little bit. But what's cool, though, is the estrogen that's released by the primary follicle actually excites that follicle to grow larger. So what, what's, what actually allows this primary follicle to become into a secondary follicle uh, is actually the little bit of estrogen that's released from it. And we'll, we'll go into more detail on this in future slides. Now, the secondary follicle is a little larger, and it contains also primary oocytes, our oocyte. Now, it has lots of layers of these granulosa cells in a fluid-filled space called an antrum. Now, the antrum is, is basically filled with a, just a, you know, a watery type of fluid that basically just suspends the primary oocyte there. And what we find that around the oocyte are two layers of cells. We have zona pellucida and corona radiata. It's just a protective type of epithelium that surrounds that primary oocyte. So what we see here then is that the primary follicle then develops into a secondary follicle. And you can see that some of the major differences here is, first of all, the epithelium is much thicker, right? And then what allowed the primary follicle to develop into a secondary follicle was in part that little bit of estrogen that's released from the follicle stimulates the follicle to grow a little larger. Not the development of new follicles, but the existing primary follicle can actually stimulate itself through the release of estrogen to grow into a secondary follicle here. 
Now, the secondary follicle still has a primary oocyte. So the, cell, the cell has not divided yet. But we still, we, now we find a larger fluid-filled space here called an antrum. Now, um, later on in development, you guys, we, uh, that secondary follicle can actually start to develop into a vesicular follicle, a.k.a. tertiary follicle. We also call this a mature or graphenian follicle, and it contains a secondary oocyte. Now, the reason why it's called a secondary oocyte is that the primary oocyte has actually undergone, undergone another round of meiosis, or basically cell division. And so after that cell is now divided, we call that a secondary oocyte. But what's interesting, though, is that the cell is actually arrested in development. Actually, it's stopped at a specific phase during meiosis, and it's held there until fertilization occurs. Okay? And that's when, the, that's when meiosis will complete. But um, this vesicular or tertiary follicle contains a secondary oocyte, which is still surrounded by your zona pellucida and corona radiata, as well as a larger antrum. So you can see here's the tertiary follicle. It's very identifiable for the fact that it has a large antrum, which is a fluid-filled space here. The follicular cells are much thicker. So you have a thicker type of epithelium here. And then we have a, a, a larger kind of secondary oocyte here, um, deeper, as well as a layer of cells like the zona pellucida and corona radiata that surround this, this secondary oocyte. Now, this is the one that would precede ovulation. Now, when ovulation occurs, effectively what happens is that this tertiary follicle or mature follicle fuses with the outer layer of the ovary. You guys see how there's a little bit of fluid out here? Uh, this may actually be the outer surface of the ovary. So what this could show then is basically how the tertiary follicle can fuse with the outer surface of the ovary, which means that this is almost like it's exocytosed. Now, it's not technically exocytosis, but it's a similar process in the sense that you have a fluid-filled vesicle that then fuses with a layer of tissue and then allows that cell to be ejected out of, you know, a cell. But in this case, it's actually an entire organ. That's what ovulation is, and it's, it's a pretty, pretty amazing process. Now, after ovulation, what happens is those follicular cells that line the whole outside of the tertiary follicle or mature follicle, those turn into corpus luteum. So what was the function of corpus luteum? To you got it. To release a tremendous amount of progesterone and some estrogen, right? And then what was the function of that progesterone and estrogen? To, to develop. develop. You got it. To stimulate the growth of the endometrium inside the uterus. And it's amazing how that's coordinated, right? Right after ovulation, the cells that were left behind after the egg was ovulated, those start releasing hormones that promote the growth of the uterus that could potentially harbor a, a fertilized egg. So it's amazingly coordinated events there. Um, so what this slide shows again, uh, you guys, is basically our corpus luteum, which is uh, you know means yellow body. No, on here it's showing it's being red, but it's just because of the stain that they applied. Um, now under certain preparations it can look yellow, but uh, these cells here are basically the, the follicular cells that would have come from the tertiary follicle, and these actually start releasing a lot of hormones like progesterone and estrogen. Now, uh, if fertilization doesn't occur, what happens is the corpus luteum will regress and degrade into a white layer of connective tissue, kind of like a scar tissue here, called corpus albicans, which literally means white body. And it's a little bit of scar tissue, which is effectively just a lot of fibrous connective tissue and dead cells that came from corpus luteum. Now, as corpus luteum degrades into corpus albicans, that is the stimulus for menses or menstruation. Because as corpus luteum is degrading, it, these cells are dying and not releasing as much hormone, right? Progesterone and estrogen. So these hormone levels start to drop off significantly. And as hormone levels start to fall, that is the stimulus for the endometrial cells to actually uh, undergo program cell death or apoptosis. And um, that's actually going to be what causes menstruation. So what this slide shows you guys, just a summary of what we talked about. So you have primordial follicles, which are followed by... Primary, well, secondary, secondary mature, mature, or tertiary, right? And then after the mature follicle, then you get ovulation. And for the cells that are left behind, those turn into corpus luteum. And then if, if fertilization doesn't occur, then we get corpus albicans. Good. And then you guys notice that there's no oocyte here because it's after ovulation, right? So the, for those, the follicle, there's no oocyte because it's left, right? It's now out in the pelvic cavity somewhere and hopefully picked up by fimbrae. Now, in the primordial follicle, we find a primary oocyte. It starts to develop during the fetal period. Uh, in the primary follicle, we also have a primary oocyte, and this starts to develop during puberty, right, at puberty, and, you know, and thereafter, up until menarche. Um, 
so uh, the secondary follicle then contains our, our primary oocyte as well, and this also continues to develop after puberty. But then uh, what happens is as the secondary follicle starts to develop into a mature or tertiary follicle, what we find then is a secondary oocyte, which is actually an, after another round of cell division. And this also occurs after puberty. So what the slide shows you guys is just a summary of oogenesis. So before birth, what we find that is an, there's something called an oogonium, which actually has 46 chromosomes. So we call this diploid, which basically means it has a full set of chromosomes and duplicate numbers of chromosomes, right? So humans have 23 types of chromosomes. We have 22 autosomes and a sex chromosome. Now, because it's an egg, it's only going to contain an X chromosome, not a Y, right? So you have 22 autosomes, chromosomes 1 through 22, and then a sex chromosome, which in this case is your X, right? That gives you 23 unique types of chromosomes. However, but for most cells of your body, you have duplicate copies of each chromosome, which gives you a complete set of 46, where you have a copy of each type of chromosome. So you have two chromosome number ones, two chromosome number twos, two chromosome X's, which is consistent with the female genotype, right? So we call this diploid, which is 46. Most cells in your body have 46 chromosomes. But gametes have half of that number. Remember, sex cells, which are involved with development, they actually have half of the number of, of chromosomes. So instead of 46, they only have 23. But it makes sense from the standpoint of, of you know, forming a new organism, because then you have 23 from uh, the father, 23 from the mother, which then combine to make a new full set of 46, right? So that means that half of your chromosomes came from one of your parents, the other half came from the other. Um, now, uh, the way that you get half of the number of chromosomes is that from this oogonium, it'll divide through mitosis, which still gives you a, a complete set of 46. We talk about mitosis back in AMP1. But for sex cell development, it occurs through a process called meiosis, which is two rounds of cell division that end up giving you half of the number of copies of chromosomes. So what we find that is that um, during, during, before birth, what happens is that this oocyte here, the primary oocyte, is actually arrested at meiosis 1. And then uh, effectively then during childhood, it's still arrested during, in cell division at meiosis 1. But then uh, at puberty, what can happen then is that this primary oocyte is actually allowed to develop then. And it's, it's stimulated by hormonal factors. But effectively what happens, you guys, is that our primary oocyte underground, undergoes a round of cell division here, making a secondary oocyte, which has half of the number of copies of chromosomes. And then the secondary oocyte is what's ovulated. But if fertilization occurs and you have a sperm that brings in half the number of copies and it fuses with an egg that has the other half of the copies, um, this will create a full set of, of, uh, of an organism here um, with 46 chromosomes. And that, will, that can actually develop into, a, you know, um, effectively a, a zygote, which is actually what precedes, you know, a fetus, which is basically a fertilized egg. Now, what co-occurs with oocyte development is follicular development, right? So we have our primordial follicle, which surrounds the primary oocyte. We have our primary follicle, which also surrounds the primary oocyte. We have our secondary follicle, which surrounds the primary oocyte. But then we have our mature follicle here, which surrounds the secondary oocyte. And it's the secondary oocyte that's the one that's ovulated. And this is the one that, that could potentially be fertilized. Um, remember, for the follicular cells that stay behind in the ovary, what do those turn into again? Corpus luteum, which secretes progesterone and estrogen. And if fertilization doesn't occur, then it would progress into corpus albicans, right? So I know this picture shows a little sperm wiggling into the, the ovum here. But let's say if this didn't happen, like if fertilization didn't occur, then the corpus luteum would degrade into corpus albicans. However, if fertilization occurs, corpus luteum will remain, um, you know, uh, through development. 